In Seattle this morning, police are hunting a mass murderer believed to have killed as many as 21 prostitutes in the last 22 months. Been called the Green River Killer ever since the first bodies, five of them, were pulled from this river. Since then, seven more bodies have been discovered nearby, all those of young prostitutes, according to police. And the number of missing increases steadily. Two were added to the list this week. All the victims work this strip near the Seattle airport, crammed with hotels, motels, and strip joints. They call it the work of the Green River Killer, probably one man who has murdered 13 young women near Seattle. Case unsolved. All deeply troubled sexually. Since 1978, 17 men have been convicted of killing 10 or more people. Historically, uh, they kill certain types of victims, women, homosexuals, and children. In Seattle, another grim discovery today. Explorer scouts have found the remains of another human body buried on a wooded hillside near Seattle. Police in Washington State believe they found the remains of another victim of the so-called Green River Killer. Another victim has been identified in the nation's longest list of unsolved murders, the Green River Killings. 37 women have died, 9 missing, all thought to be victims of the same killer. One lucky break. One individual out there that knows in their heart who's done this and has been reluctant to come forward. This suspect, this individual, has had a remarkable string of luck. In the early 80s, police in Washington State tied the deaths of 49 young women to the so-called Green River Killer. The killer apparently left the region in 1984, but the number of murders is on the rise again, and police fear the killer may be back. Hello and welcome to the DeathCast. I am your host, best-selling author, Ian Tott, and as you can tell from that rather extended trailer, we are going to be looking into the crimes of Gary Leon Ridgway, better known as the Green River Killer. Before we get into the case of Gary Ridgway, we have a couple of show notes as well as the normal plugs. I have secured an interview with Gary Meese, a former reporter in West Memphis, whose works I used when I covered the case of the West Memphis Three last year. Gary has agreed to come on the show, discuss the case, as well as the current developments in it. So that will be coming up after we get through with the Green River Killer. If you would like to follow the show on social media, that's on MeWe, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, where all episodes of the show go up in a video format. Just search for Ian Totten, author, hit like or subscribe, and there you go instant friends. Uh, You can interact with me and other listeners of the show as well as give your opinion on the various cases that I cover. Thoughts on the show and a whole lot of not suitable for work memes as well as recommend cases for me to cover. Something that I don't know if a lot of people realize is a lot of these cases I cover have been suggested to me by the listeners and I'm always up for looking into something either I'm not aware of or was never really interested in diving too deeply into if you want to support the show you can go to your favorite podcast website Subscribe, share on social media, and leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Podcast Attic, anywhere else to let you leave a review. It really does help the show, and I honestly appreciate it. 
If you would like to help with the production of this show, just go to CorpseCreekPublishing.com. That's my official website for both my novels as well as this podcast. And click on the donate button. Send a couple dollars my way to help with the production of this show. It's very time-consuming. And were something to happen, say, to my computer, it's doubtful that I would be able to either get it fixed or purchase a new one for a little while. So donations do help keep the show running again, especially when it comes to the computer, which is quite old and archaic. Alright, now that the plugs are out of the way, get yourself something to drink, sit back in a chair, relax, kick off your shoes, I've got my coffee, I've got my cigarettes. Let's go to the Green River. Looking at the crimes of the Green River Killer, it's first important to note where it was specifically that he hunted. It was along a section of the Pacific Coast Highway, often referred to as Old 99 or Highway 99. Highway 99 runs up from California into Washington and Oregon. To give you an idea, anyone who is familiar with the geography of this particular part of the country, Route 5 runs parallel to 99. It's actually to the west of 99. Route 5, I believe, if not mistaken, replaced Highway 99 as the main thoroughfare between the states. And as anybody who has studied true crime in that region of the country for a while will know, Route 5 was often referred to as the Serial Killer Highway, and that is because so many serial killers in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and up until today used it as a manner of hunting and stalking their prey. The Green River Killer was no exception to this rule, however, he was over on Highway 99, which in the particular area that he stalked in between Seattle and Tacoma was known as the SeaTac Highway. And this particular area specifically at this period of time, the late 70s, early 80s, had seen better days, Uh, you know, it was known as a place to pick up sex workers, many of whom were underage runaways. There's a lot of different reasons why girls turn to walking the streets as it were sometimes it's because of their home life or you know they get mixed in with a bad crowd a lot of these girls have heavy drug addictions and they turn to selling their bodies as a means to support their habits also because of this a lot of these girls end up under the sway of who manipulate them to get the girls to do what they want, oftentimes by feigning to care about them, when in reality they're using the girls, and they have other coercive methods as well, including and not limited to extreme physical violence. A lot of pimps won't harm their girls to the point that they can't go out and make money, but that doesn't mean that, you know, if a girl shows up and she's a couple of dollars short, she's going to get a turn stalking to. Now, a lot of these guys will beat them mercilessly or allow friends of theirs to rape them as retribution for whatever the perceived slight is. And the SeaTac Highway was rife 
with this kind of activity. There were hotels and motels and strip clubs all along the length. So it really isn't that surprising that a predator would appear on the scene and begin stalking these girls. The thing that is surprising, as you'll see, however, is how quickly the police got onto this case and sought to stop the individual who was doing this. And I say that because oftentimes when you have somebody who is stalking and killing prostitutes, law enforcement officials tend to turn a blind eye because many of them, I don't know if it's still this way, but it was historically seen that it was almost a victimless crime in that these girls were selling their bodies, therefore they really had no rights. And that's one of the reasons I decided to cover this particular story. When I first became aware of the Green River Killer in the mid to late 90s, you know, I was a teenager, I was into a lot of dark stuff, you know, this serial killer who was unknown and kept out on the West Coast uh, was hunting prostitutes. I never really thought of the women that he was killing as people, and I don't believe that I'm alone in that. I think that was a mindset that was pretty pervasive across the country was actually Anne Rule's book, Green River Running Red, that changed my mind on that because she did such a fantastic job of profiling the victims that were known at the time that the book came out, as well as you know, fleshing them out and making them real. And as a little aside note, I really think that the Green River case, as well as Miss Rule's book on it, was a huge influence on my own novel, The Throwaway Girls of Olympia, where an unknown killer is stalking prostitutes and mercilessly killing them. You know, one of the goals of that book to me was to give the characters, the victims, some semblance of being real people and to flesh them out somewhat and that was a direct result of that book and I have since then discovered networks like the Doe Network which seeks to identify unidentified victims of violent crime you know those girls whose bodies were found and were never able to be identified and it's not just in the Green River case, it's in murders all across the country. So I do follow along, you know, with organizations like that to find out, you know, if these women are able to have a name and a face put to them, as opposed to simply being another statistic. On Thursday, July 15th of 1982, two young boys found a body floating in the Green River underneath the Peck Bridge near Meager Street in Kent, Washington. From what the police could initially tell, the woman had been tied up or some such as there were rope or similar bonds attached to her arm and legs. And really the only thing that the police released at this point was that they believed the young woman who was white had been strangled. She was dressed in a pair of jeans, a lace trimmed blue and white striped blouse, and was wearing white tennis shoes. There were a number of physical markings on the body, including five tattoos. And eventually, because of these tattoos, a tattoo artist came forward and identified the work as his, stating that he believed she lived with her mother and that she was not, in fact, an adult, but was instead a 16-year-old girl by the name of Wendy Lee Caulfield. 
Wendy's mother, Virginia Caulfield, stated after being you know, told that her daughter had been pulled from the river that she had somewhat expected this as her daughter had been working as a prostitute. Wendy had dropped out of school some point during junior high, and according to her mother, that was when her troubles really began. And according to Wendy's mother, both her and her daughter had a similarly rough upbringing as far as, you know, kind of being social misfits and outcasts. And apparently Wendy had a few minor run-ins with the law. At one point, according to her mother, when Wendy was 14 or 15, she was raped by a man who had given her a ride while she was out hitchhiking. And her problems grew from there as Wendy, who had been something of a runaway, really began to flee home in earnest and began racking up many more run-ins with the law, at one point landing in juvenile detention for stealing food stamps. And a part of me has to believe that Wendy got involved in drugs somewhere along the way, which would explain why she was prostituting herself on the streets. The Kent City Police Department were assigned her case as her body was found inside of their jurisdiction, and despite the police's best efforts, they were unfortunately unable to find any evidence indicating who might have killed Wendy Caulfield. For those who are curious, yes, much like my coverage of the Atlanta child murders, this is going to be a deep dive series, and barring you know, unforeseen circumstances, I am going to be getting deep into not only the murderer, but into his victims, their lives, really try and show who these unfortunate women were. So Wendy Caulfield was murdered, and Many people didn't take notice of it. In fact, from what I could see, there was almost new, no news coverage beyond an article or two in the local paper even listing that she had been found in the river. And one of the reasons for this was just prior to Wendy's body being found, two people had died from taking cyanide-laced extra scent strength, etc. This was a copycat killing, which was inspired by the Chicago Tylenol murders. If you don't know what those are, I, I rarely plug any other true crime podcasts, but the guys over at True Crime Garage did a really good two-part series on that case. So if you want to know what that was, you know, go out of your way to look for it. That's the True Crime Garage. They're a huge podcast, so if you're listening to this, I can't imagine that you've never heard them. Anyways, you have these two people who died from tampered with extra strength Excedrin, and that really, you know, grabbed the news headlines, especially since the Tylenol murders had taken national headlines. So Wendy Caulfield's murder really didn't receive much press. Thursday, August 12th of 1982, another woman's body was found in the Green River, about a quarter to a half a mile from where Wendy's had been found. This victim's body was found by a man working for a local meatpacking company. And unlike Wendy's body, this victim was completely nude. Police could find no traces as to where she had gone into the water. 
And again, unfortunately, they were unable to find any traces as to who the killer might be. Unlike in Wendy's case, this victim was found inside of King County, so King County detectives took charge of this investigation. They were quickly able to ascertain who the victim was. It was a 22-year-old woman by the name of Deborah Lynn Bonner. She, much like Wendy, had been working as a prostitute out on the SeaTac Strip. Deborah had had a number of run-ins with the law. In fact, in the 30 days preceding her body being found, she had been arrested twice for offering sex for money. It was quickly discovered that she had last been seen on July 25th, which was 18 days before her body was found. She had left a motel located on the corner of Pack Highway and 216th Street, telling friends that she was going to catch some dates. Deborah had a similar life to Wendy's in that she had grown up in the area and was also a school dropout. However, unlike Wendy, it appears that Deborah was at least one point trying to better herself by getting her GED. Eventually, she fell in love with a man who it seems was all too content to allow her to support him, which is a nice way of saying that the man had no problem with her going out and selling her body in order to earn a living for the two of them. It sounds to me as though this man was more likely than not a pimp. Gabra ended up being introduced to heroin at some point after dropping out and she was never able to escape the vicious cycle that she found herself in from that point onward. What is known about her last few days is that Deborah had called home to her family to check on her father, who had recently had an eye operation, and she was also known to be working to pay off fines she had in as a result of working the streets. A bartender who was familiar with her informed police that she had come in and it confided in them that she was being stalked by her boyfriend slash pimp and that the man was claiming she owed him several, several thousand dollars which I have to imagine the police investigated and found to be, at the very least, that the command was not responsible for her murder. Despite the fact that this man had once been convicted in the shooting death of a friend over what has been reported as being a debt of $25. But that is a good indication of the type of men who were running within the prostitution scene that they thought so cheaply of human life they would kill someone over so little an amount of money. It gives you an idea of how they viewed the women who were underneath their control. And I think that is something that is important to point out, especially in our society. People of a certain age will understand what it is I'm saying when I talk about how there was a period of time in the mid to late 90s, early 2000s where being a pimp was somewhat glamorized by television stations such as MTV. They had a number of shows out that, you know, really painted them in a much prettier light than they are deserving because there is such a dark side to that lifestyle you know the abusive controlling violent 
aspect of it that is glanced over and almost trivialized within our society. Here we have Deborah, who, you know, was living proof of that. She was running from this guy because she feared for her life, you know, rightfully so. And it makes you wonder if, in fact, because of this fear, you know, her senses weren't on their highest of alert the night that she met her killer, or if, you know, she was under the influence of something. But in any event, she did eventually meet that killer and was pulled from the Green River. And unlike in Wendy's killing, the police and Deborah's reached out to other jurisdictions to try and find out if they had had similar murders. As the theory they were running on at the time of Deborah's death was that maybe there was something like a pimp war going on in the streets and that the various pimps were maybe killing off each other's girls to drive you know, someone out of business. However, on August 15th of 1982, things took a drastic change. Two bodies were found floating in the Green River. That of 31-year-old Marcia Faye Chapman and 17-year-old Cynthia Jean Hines. These bodies were found by a local treasure hunter who was actually uh, out on the water trying to see if he could find bottles and other various things that he might be able to sell for a profit. Something interesting to note, however, with both of these women, both uh, Marcia Chapman and Cynthia Hines, is that they disappeared actually 10 days apart, which... I've never seen anything anywhere that suggested that the Green River Killer kept his victims prisoner, but I do find it very odd that they were both found on the exact same date given the discrepancy in their last known appearances. Chapman was known to be seen last on August 1st. Well, Cynthia Hines was last seen on August 11th when officers from the Kings County Sheriff's Department arrived. They realized pretty quickly that something was not right with the scene as the bodies seemed to be stationary in the water. The officers went down to the riverbank, going down a very steep embankment and Once they got down there, they realized that whoever had placed the women in the water had been trying to conceal them as large rocks had been placed onto their chests and abdomens to hold them down beneath the water's surface. And it was later found that you couldn't even see where the bodies were from the roadway. But something else happened that morning that really, you know, put the detectives on high alert and made them understand that they weren't just really dealing with a random series of killings. Because while they were looking at the two bodies in the water and waiting for search and rescue to arrive, another sheriff who was standing on the riverbank nearly tripped over something that was in on the water's edge and when he turned around to discover what it was I have to imagine that all the color drained from his face and that his mouth probably went dry because there was another body on the riverbank there and that one was 16 year old Opal Charmaine Mills I just want you to think about that, you know, in a course of a three-week period, you had two bodies turn up, and then on the 15th of August, uh, Treasure Hunter finds two bodies in the water, the police arrive, 
you know, they're checking out this scene, looking at the area, and then one of the detectives nearly trips over a third body. So let's look at these three victims. The first to be identified was Marcia Faye Chapman. That was the 31-year-old. She was a small, slender African-American woman, woman who lived on the Sea track Strip with her three children and supported them through prostitution. As with the first two murder victims, Chapman had been strangled. It was quickly learned that all three of these women had been strangled as well, with Opal Mills having been strangled with her own shorts. As for Chapman and Hines, police found that the two women had been raped before being murdered, and afterwards had had small triangular stones placed inside of their vaginas before they were put into the water. Cynthia Hines, the 17-year-old, was also African American, and she had last been seen by her pimp on August 11th near the SeaTac Strip and South 200th Street. The man had watched while she got into a black Jeep with a male driver, although he did not write down her the license plate number or any of that information. The final victim, Opal Mills, was a short, slightly chubby girl who was not known by her family to work in prostitution. In fact, the only things that they were able to find that linked her to it was Opal's friendship with Cynthia Hines. According to Opal's family, she was an integral part of their lives, unlike many of the other girls who would on occasion stay out overnight for a day or two, but always returned home, and who had gone out to work on the last day that she had been seen alive, supposedly to paint houses with Cynthia Hines. Opal was of mixed race, with her father, be Robert, being African American, and her mother being white. Of her home life, it has been said that her father was a fairly aggressive, angry man. And by all accounts, you know, the father's actions is maybe one of the reasons that Opal, you know, took to staying out of the house and eventually fell into the sphere of Cynthia Hines. And it wasn't just physical abuse that the children suffered in their household. The father was known to lock the cupboards and the refrigerator because he felt his children ate too much. He was also known to kill any pets that they brought home and would tell their ch- his children that their showering used up too much hot water, therefore they had to take cold showers. And as a result of this, Opal and her brother, who from by all accounts absolutely doted on his younger sister, spent a lot of their time at the next door neighbor's house eating and showering. Opal was something of a rebellious child. You know, she was always running around and couple of accounts that I found said that she was quote-unquote boy crazy. Uh, You know, she was a typical 15, 16-year-old girl who, you know, in her own mind was going out with every guy she saw that drew her fancy. And she also dropped out of school and was working on getting her GED. At this point, we have five killings with no end in sight, no suspect, either seen or, you know, spoken to by police. And because of this, on August 16th, the first Green River Task Force was organized. 
It was a fairly big task force given the period of time that we're talking about. It included investigators from King County, the Seattle Police Department, the Tacoma Police Department, and the Kent State Police Department. One thing of note about this task force is a number of the men who were working as part of it had also worked on the Ted murders in the early to mid-1970s. For those who don't know about that, go and look up Ted Bundy and you'll see a lot of the same detectives' names uh, as they were integral in helping to track and attempt to capture Bundy. So, these men had some experience tracking serial killers, especially killers who were very good at masking their tracks, blending in, and almost disappearing. But the task before them was much different than that of Ted Bundy. Because Bundy had been going after mostly co-eds, girls who came from stable backgrounds and stable home lives, were enrolled in college. The Green River Killer, however, as I've illustrated, was going after women who lived on the fringes of society and were more often than not ignored when people encountered them unless those individuals were looking for what these women had to sell. And I know later on, as the killings continued, uh, there was a lot of public outrage from people over the police's inability to catch the killer. Uh, There was also a lot of fear, because even women who were not themselves prostitutes feared that they may become a victim of this individual. But I have to believe that fear was creeping in along the SeaTac at this point among the young women who worked on it, even if they was one of those things where they didn't want to admit it to themselves and would instead put on these false airs of they're too smart or tough to be captured by this individual. I I do believe that the girls were starting to get scared over this because I no one had any idea of who it was that was committing the murders and a lot of these girls had their regulars and even they I'm sure were thinking you know could this guy be the one so they started looking at a myriad of different possibilities from you know could this be a serial killer couple so to speak you know in line with uh, Roy Norris and Lawrence Bittaker or Could it be, you know, like a religious group of crusaders out to rid the streets of prostitutes? But eventually, the task force settled on the lone killer theory. They also theorized that he was watching the news. Hence, when he disposed of his three latest victims placing rocks on top of the bodies to try and weigh them down. One thing the police noted at this point was that a number of girls began leaving the sea track strip and moving on to Seattle where it was felt they could work in safer conditions. Something else I'm going to point out really quick is that there are other victims who predate the ones who are on the so quote unquote so called official list and these are women that the police strongly suspect Ridgeway was involved in murdering and that is important to keep in mind as I go through this because Gary Ridgeway has confessed to anywhere from 70 to 90 or more victims. It depends on the news and 
uh, law enforcement source that you're using to get your information as well as you know really the day of the week that he feels like opening his mouth and giving a victim count my personal opinion is he probably killed well into the hundreds and more likely than that far exceeded uh, Samuel Little who to date is the has the most known victims in American history. I have a feeling that Ridgeway probably has dozens upon dozens of victims who will never be known about or attributed to him officially. September 25th, 1982, another body was found. This was of 17-year-old Gazelle Ann Lavorne who was 17, she was from California, and by all accounts had a near genius level IQ, and it might be because of that that she kind of flittered through life, dropping out of school before moving to Seattle with a much older man who, according to various reports, was fairly seedy and manipulative, She was known to be a big fan of both the Grateful Dead and the Charlie Daniels Band, often traveling hundreds of miles to see either of these acts. Somehow she ended up involved in prostitution. And now her boyfriend, whose name, so far as I could see, has never been publicly released, said that he tried many times to talk her out of, you know, walking the strip in order to earn a living. In any event, Gazelle went out on the afternoon of July 17th, 1982, and was never seen again. This is an important thing to note here, as she vanished not long after the first victim, Wendy Lee Caulfield. And Caulfield was in fact found two days before Gazelle disappeared. Despite whatever flaws her boyfriend might have had, he did report her missing on July 17th. When Gazelle's body was found on the 25th of September. It was by a hiker. She had been laid out in the bushes along an overgrown yard of some type. And it was apparently, you know, a pretty disturbing scene as she had was in an advanced state of decomposition, so much so that that no one was able to visually identify her. They had to identify her body using dental records. Hmm? And the task force, you know, pretty much were, you know, going full tilt at this point, trying to find the man responsible for that they knew of at this time six slayings. However, there were other victims who disappeared during this period of time who were not linked to the Green River murders right away. They would later be, but during this period of time, there were girls who had gone missing and police, you know, privately suspected that they were probably, uh, you know, victims of this killer. And... They started doing something of a profile on the man that they thought was responsible. It was obvious to them that the individual probably lived somewhere in the vicinity of the SeaTac Highway Strip. And they also felt that the man was, you know, probably unassuming and able to blend into his surroundings. He was also a very cunning individual, as evidenced by the fact that he stopped dropping the bodies into the river, starting with uh, Giselle uh, Lavorne, and in fact 
placed her out basically into the wilderness, something they weren't certain that he was going to do. In fact, they were hoping that he would continue to use the dump site in the Green River, which unfortunately he did not, as they had most of that section of the river staked out round the clock in the hopes of catching this individual. One of the young women who had gone missing at this during this period of time was Terry Renee Milligan, who was a 16-year-old. She went missing on August 29th, 1982. Terry was said to have plans on going to Yale when she completed high school, although this changed when she became pregnant upon entering middle school, and Terry dropped out of school and moved in with a boyfriend. Terry was last seen walking on South 114th Street and Pacific Highway South. She was an African American, and as you'll see, this happens quite a bit. It would be years before her remains would be found. On September 15, 1982, an 18-year-old by the name of Mary Bridget Meehan went missing. And unlike a number of other girls that ended up being victims of the Green River Killer, Mary Meehan had a very strong familiar bond and by all accounts was, you know, deeply in love with her boyfriend at the time. I really haven't seen too much to indicate that her boyfriend was actually pimping her. It seems that she just ended up making that one wrong choice in her life that led to, uh, you know, prostitution. By all accounts, Mary was a very warm and outgoing young girl who could control a room, which is to say she had a fairly commanding presence. And at the time that she went missing, Mary was pregnant with her and her boyfriend Ray's child, which makes what happened to her all the more tragic. As I had said, you know, she was, you know, one of those people that just seems to have it, that one thing that draws everybody's attention to them. And this might be the reason why when she was 15, 16 years old, she began dating a guy whose name I have not been able to find, but who her parents, you know, extremely disapproved of. And, I mean, it got to the point that they basically said, you need to stop seeing this guy, we're setting curfews. Uh, She would still continue sneaking out of the house to see this guy, to the point that uh, eventually her parents had had enough and hoping to break her, their daughter from the spell that this guy had her under, they told her she couldn't come home anymore so long as she was still seeing this guy. So she eventually moved in with this individual and ended up becoming pregnant, something that her boyfriend was not okay with at all. However, Bridget was from a very devout Irish Catholic family, and abortion was something that she would never consider. The first pregnancy, she miscarried, and when she became pregnant again, her boyfriend kicked her out of the house. This led to a period in her life where she was basically couch surfing between friends' homes. And remember, this young woman was not like so many of the others on the list. She came from a very strong and supportive background as far as her family was concerned. But as with many people in that age group, she was determined to make her own decisions in life. And unfortunately, those decisions proved to be tragic for Mary Meehan. 
um, you look at her life and you can see a young woman who's struggling. She has a lot of people, you know, pulling and rooting for her. A lot of decent men that are interested in being her friend and or boyfriend. And unlike many of these other young victims, she was actually doing fairly okay for herself. She had been, you know, working what would be considered legitimate jobs at hotels and at nursing homes. But eventually, for whatever reason, the personal demons that she was battling with led her into prostitution. At least on occasion, she did end up moving back in with her parents and began taking continued education courses where she met man by the name of Ray who impregnated her. And by all accounts, Ray came from a fairly well-to-do family. His father was in the club and restaurant business, but there, his son had, a, you know, a really volatile temper and their relationship was on again, off again, with some accounts stating that he hit Bridget on a number of occasions. Eventually, it was decided that she would have this baby and put it up for adoption, which she did do, although roughly a month or so after giving birth to this baby, Bridget became impregnated again by Ray. There followed the two of them moving in together and living outside of Seattle before moving back to the area and living uh, in a hotel that Ray's father was paying for. It is known that Mary contacted a battered woman shelter at one point claiming that Ray was hitting her again, and this was shortly before she disappeared. And despite what Ray insisted to police. There were a number of people that said Bridget was in fact working as a prostitute prior to vanishing. It is known, however, that she informed her parents that she was going to get herself back on track once the baby was born. However, that was not to be. At this point in things... Yeah, the community started drawing lines with a number of individuals, particularly newspapers, victim-blaming the prostitutes and their way of life for their own demise, with others showing sympathy towards these young women who had done their hardest to make the best of a bad situation and unfortunately paid the ultimate price. The Green River Task Force knew that they had these other girls missing, but as of yet, they had no bodies. This can be... There's a number of factors that contributed to this. One is the fact that the killer had stopped dumping the bodies in a public place like the Green River and instead had moved out into the thick forests that surround the area. It was, it was a situation where he was learning as he was going. Something that you see time and again with serial murderers. They start out one way, you know, operating under a certain method, but as they perfect their craft, so to speak, the way that they operate changes, and that can be anything from how they pick up their victims to how they dispose of and where they dispose of them. And that was the case with the Green River Killer. He was still picking up his victims from the same area, but he had changed where he was getting rid of them. He actually started doing what was called cluster sites where he would find an area and leave a bunch of bodies in that area before moving on to another one. And unfortunately, 
the police always seem to be two or three steps behind him at all turns. And that's not to say that the police were doing nothing. They were out combing the streets, talking to the girls who worked on the SeaTac, as well as talking to the various men who frequented the area, whom they would pull over and arrest for trying to solicit sex workers. And in this way, eventually you'll see, they did encounter the killer early on in the case, but unfortunately, they and no one else knew who or what it was that they were looking for. With this spat of disappearances to the girls who were working on the SeaTac, really began talking to each other and warning one another about various individuals who they felt might be suspicious suspects letting them know this guy's into that kind of thing or this one has a bit of a temper or you know he's into some really kinky weird stuff so the girls were you know looking out for each other in their own way in this method before I get into, you know, any more of the missing, the police had two suspects early on in the case, one of them by the name of Foster, who was a cab driver. And the reason that Foster ended up becoming a suspect is he was, you know, something of a police groupie, which is an individual who inserts themselves into cases, which Foster did, but he also was known among the prostitutes as a somewhat eccentric guy who claimed to be looking out for their best interests. Reality is he was looking out for these girls, but there are a number of reports that he also charged them, so to speak, sexually for his looking out for them. The police thought that Foster was such a good suspect that he had to go and provide alibi witnesses who corroborated what Foster had told them in order to get his name removed from the suspect list. Another victim was a man by the name of John Hanks who had been convicted of murdering his first wife's older sister, stabbing the woman 16 times. And I understand that the police were looking, you know, for anybody who might be, you know, in the periphery of the prostitution rings. But even then, I have to believe they understood enough about uh, modus operandi, that is, MO, to know that it's fairly rare for an individual to go from stabbing murderers or shooting murderers to strangulations. I mean, you will have some escalation in the violence of crime, such as an individual who starts by raping or cutting up their victims, going to more extreme lengths, such as dismemberment or even eating of flesh. But it's a whole nother ball game for them to go from stabbing to ligature strangulation or strangulation by hands or even using their forearms and their upper arm as a vice to cut off the windpipe. That's that's a big jump and a complete shift in the way they operate. Hanks, however, came to police's attention. He was a as well as being a former convict, he was a computer technician, and apparently he had tied his wife up and choked her unconscious, which is what brought him to the police's attention. However, Hanks was found to have been in San Francisco during the time period that these initial murders took place, and he was eventually dropped as a suspect. So this is where we are going to leave the Green River killer for today. There has been a slew of at least six murders 
with a number of other women having gone missing in the span of a little less than the month. The police had two suspects that looked good to them who didn't pan out. And now they are going to start reaching out to the FBI, to the Behavioral Science Center's unit, where men like Robert Ressler, Royal Hazelwood, and John Douglas were working. And it's actually going to be John Douglas who comes up with the first working profile of the man that they should be looking for. The Death Cast is a production of Corpse Creek Publishing. Again, I am your host, best-selling author, Ian Totten. I'd like to thank you for joining me today as we dipped our toes into the Green River. Until next time, stay morbid.